Continuing in our study of the book of Matthew, we'll be picking up in chapter 12, around verse 30, where we left off last time. Let's ask the Lord to bless this time in Bible study as we look to His Word. Heavenly Father God, Lord, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for what it is that has been given to us, that which allows us to be able to draw close in relationship with You. Lord, not just words, not just that which was spoken through a writer, but the words of our Lord Himself, as we'll see today. As Jesus' words were recorded, as by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they've been retained in this record, in this document that we have of God's love letter to His children. And Lord, that we may grow from it by learning of it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus has just gone public in a really big way. We know that he is ministering and he's going into the different areas and in the synagogues and, and teaching in that. And, and this was a common practice for, for rabbis of the day that would come through a town. But Jesus has done some things that, well, don't set real well with the Pharisees. The last thing that we saw him do is he healed on the Sabbath. What a terrible thing to do. A terrible thing for him to do because it was a violation, according to the Pharisees, of the law for working on the Sabbath. He himself, who claimed to be of God, was now violating the very law that God had given them. They're drawing battle lines. As a matter of fact, in the last portion of the the, the message we had last week, we saw that they set out on how they could destroy him. Well, Jesus is about to draw some battle lines of his very own. And in verse 30 of Matthew chapter 12, it says, He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Now, this is not a real popular doctrine. But it comes directly from Jesus, so it is doctrine. There's no neutral ground when it comes to Jesus Christ. There's only two sides in which we can choose from. We are either with Him or we oppose Him. But it goes much deeper than just to simply simply accept who Jesus is or what He's all about. Because even those who are not persuaded by Christianity can have a great respect and reverence for Jesus as a person. There's those who reject Him as the Son of God but will still hold up Jesus as being a great teacher. One who is worthy of being followed just because of his moral positions and stances. They'll say that Jesus was a a great moral teacher, a great humanitarian, a great philosopher, but not the God in flesh. He's worthy to be recognized among other great teachers, but not as the Son of God. C.S. Lewis pointed out in his book, Mere Christianity, that the idea that Jesus was a mere human being, even though great, is completely indefensible. You see, Jesus made some of the most astonishing claims concerning society, ethics, God, and Himself. Jesus claimed to have the authority to forgive sin. He identified Himself as the representative for all of humanity that had come to die in order to reconcile humanity to God. He proclaimed to be the only means, listen, He proclaimed to be the only means by which mankind can attain salvation. The claims of Jesus are unlike any other teacher, any other philosopher ever known to man. Faced with these claims that Jesus made, there's really only three conclusions that we can draw. There's only three places that we can land in relationship to what He means. First, if Jesus' claims are false and He knew it, then He is, above all, the most recognized deceiver of all times. But if Jesus' claims were false and He didn't know it, then he is among one of the most influential, delusioned persons of all time. Leaving us with the third, and that is that Jesus' claims are true. You see, we have to determine 
which one of these Jesuses that we want to believe? Is, we, is it the Jesus who's the liar? Is it the Jesus who's the lunatic? Or is it the Jesus who is Lord? Because He can only be one of these three. If we have any other view of Jesus Christ, then we're not taking the claims that He made seriously. We're not recognizing what He said about Himself. What He demonstrated during His ministry. What He proved by His resurrection. If we say the claims of Jesus were false and He knew it, it means that above all that He is the greatest deceiver of all times. That He is the greatest recognized, the, the, the very person who split time, who has been written about more than any other person on the face of the earth, who more people have followed, who more people have been engaged with in relationship, if He is lying about that and knew that He was lying when He did it, He certainly is not a teacher worth following. He's the head of all deceivers. We would be absolutely lost and ridiculous to be here today and follow one who was purposing to deceive the world in such a way. We take the second position and we say that Jesus made these false claims, but he didn't recognize it. Well, then he must have been delusional. If Jesus was an ordinary person that truly believed himself to be God, then he was a nut. He was a lunatic. And in this case, we'd have to determine that Jesus was unable to distinguish between truth and fiction. He was a delusional egomaniac. He was simply insane. So insane that he was unable to distinguish the truth, a truth that would have even saved his own life. Again, if this is the, ta the case and he was anything other than true, then he would not be a teacher worth following. He was not a great humanitarian. He was not a great moral leader. He was crazy. He was a lunatic. And again, he would go down as the worst teacher on the face of the planet, carrying the most influence. The third option is if the claims of Jesus are true, it means that He is truly the Son of God. And thus the Lord God come in flesh. And it's not that He's merely a great man or a prophet or a teacher or a humanitarian. Jesus is the one true and living God. And if we take Jesus seriously, we must also then take his claims seriously. The claims that he made about himself. We can't admire, listen, we can't admire and look up to Jesus as a great teacher and a good man, but in the most fundamental elements of his teaching, he was wrong or in error. Jesus has to be taken as a mere human teacher who then was a deceiver to do so who is delusional, if unaware, or he is truly the Son of God. There is no middle ground. There's no option in believing. Listen, this is so important. There's no option in believing in God, but not believing in Jesus Christ if there's to be salvation. There is no God that provides salvation outside of His Son, Jesus Christ. And it's so important that we understand that because without Jesus, there is no salvation. It doesn't matter for all of those that want to say, well, I believe in God. I believe in a higher power. I believe that there's a God, a creator. I believe all of that. I just don't, I don't accept this Jesus thing. Then you're denying the very God that sent His Son to die on your behalf in order that you would be reconciled and able to receive salvation in eternity. Jesus Himself declared without doubt. And for those that want to say that Jesus never said He was God, boy, I don't know what Bible they're reading. I don't know how they missed that. I don't know how they missed when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then no one, He didn't say, I'm just another way. 
I have some true things that I've said. You can get to heaven through me in a lot of different ways. And that's yet what the enemy has tried to promote in relationship to the fact that there's those out there that believe that they can have a relationship with God. They can even name Jesus as a great man, a philosopher, a prophet, a part of the story. Guys, Jesus is the story. And He is the only story that leads to salvation. And that's why Jesus says, if you are not with me, you are against me. There is no middle ground. There's not those that are saved and those that aren't saved and those that are somewhere in the middle. There is no middle ground. You've either accepted and received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're either a saint or you're an ain't. With this understanding, Jesus then goes to the point of identifying what is the unpardonable sin. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of God, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age of to come now when we first read that it's easy to think man this something doesn't seem right about this i mean how is it that someone can speak against jesus and that can be forgiven but it won't be forgiven if we speak against the holy spirit does this mean that somehow or another that the holy spirit is more important than jesus the answer to that is yes and no it's not that the holy spirit is of more value than Jesus, but the message that he brings is. Stay with me. The first thing we have to understand is that the unpardonable sin is not a sin of the lips. It's a sin of the heart. It's not with the lips that one commits the unpardonable sin because what comes out of the mouth is what is vested, what is stored in the heart. Look at what it says in verse 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers. How can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Words from the lips are evidence of the condition of the heart. And evil words indicate, listen, evil in the heart. When Jesus calls the Pharisees a brood of vipers, I mean, this is a strong condemnation of them i mean he's he's letting them have it you remember just in the last section that we studied they said that he was casting out demons by the power of beelzebub that he was working in in concert with the enemy that he was casting out demons by the the head of the demons by satan and of course jesus argued with them in logic and he said it doesn't make any sense a house that is divided can't stand but see what jesus has just done is he has equated them with that old snake he has equated them with satan and he's saying the evil that you're operating under and see they knew what he was saying to call them a brood of vipers was not a good thing talk about a, a, a completely politically incorrect phrasing jesus just associated them with the enemy of lies the pharisees had seen his miracles and yet they hardened their hearts. They chose to reject Christ and refuse to accept Him in light of everything that they saw. This is another aspect of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Understand, it is done in the light of revelation. It's done in the light of great rev evidence. No one is ever going to commit the unpardonable sin without knowing it. No one is ever going to be able to stand in front of God and say, I didn't know. I didn't understand. Nobody told me. That wouldn't be justice. 
that wouldn't be fair. And it will never happen because God, if anything, is just and fair. This is why the only sin that cannot be forgiven, listen, because there's those that have just really messed this up. People don't understand that there's only one sin that cannot be forgiven. I've had people come to me and say, but pastor, you don't understand what I've done. I did this and I did that. I've had people come to me and, and confess that they had been a murderer, that they had been an adulterer, that they had, and you know, I said, well, well, you know, when I go back and I look, those kind of folks have been forgiven. David, great example. Top 10. He nailed a bunch of them. Yet was a man after God's own heart. So what is this unpardonable sin? The only sin that can't be forgiven is willful and persistent unbelief and rejection of Jesus Christ. It's the only sin that can't be forgiven. You see, the only sin that can't be forgiven is to refuse what the Holy Spirit testifies to. You see, the whole job of the Holy Spirit is to come by and to knock on your heart and say, hello, hello. You need to turn to Jesus. You need to go to Jesus because Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life, the only means by salvation, the only path that God has made that you can receive salvation. Hello? And the Holy Spirit will come back again and go, hello? And you guys know it, those that have answered the call. How many times did the Holy Spirit come by and go, McFly? <laughs> Until you finally listened. The whole job of the Holy Spirit is to woo is to call, is to court, is to demonstrate the love of God, to bring us into an understanding. And then he stands squarely and he points to Jesus Christ and says, that's the way. Come on, that's the way. And Jesus says, the only sin that I cannot forgive, that will not be forgiven in heaven, is for you to look, see what the Holy Spirit says and say, I don't want it. I don't want it. I reject it. Now, the bad part about this rejection is a time will come when the Holy Spirit will go, okay, you got it. I get it. How many of you had the Holy Spirit come around to you one or more times? Yeah, two, three, four, five. I love that he's patient, but you know what? A time will come when he stops. And you'll no longer hear the call. And you know those people because you've talked to those people. You've seen those people who are just so hard to anything and this is what jesus is saying about the pharisees you guys have hardened your hearts you've turned to the point that it's right in front of you and you won't see it the miracles the words the signs of the messiah everything that was given to you wasn't just out there and you just don't understand it you understand it you're refusing to accept Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is not a matter of words. It's a matter of the heart. But it doesn't mean that our words aren't important. Jesus says that words are evidence of what's in that heart. And the only way to receive salvation is through Him. The only way to lose salvation is by rejection. But our words matter. The scary part is, well, just read it with me. 36. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Comforting thought, isn't it? Talk about a database. I was watching something the other day on the news and they were talking about how these social media entities like Facebook and Twitter and everything else out there is capturing all of this information and capturing, I mean, you guys, you guys realize every email, every text message you have ever written lives somewhere. I mean, you guys know that. You delete it off your phone. It's not deleted. It's in somebody's database. It's in, a, it's in a data warehouse somewhere being stored, and they can find it. It's still there. Every dumb thing you said on Facebook 
forever is forever recorded it's forever kept and people are like well i don't like that that's invasion of privacy well then stay off those places there's no expectation of privacy on social media and there's certainly no expectation of privacy when it comes to god i think it's hilarious when somebody about halfway through the conversation finds out that I'm a pastor. And then they start trying to remember what they said. (laughs) And then they start apologizing for things they didn't say. (laughs) As if somehow or another, by saying it in front of me, reveals it to God. Ooh, don't, don't tell that joke to Gary. He's a pastor. Don't say that in front of him. It's like, dude... You're already toast, man. He knows. Every word you say is being recorded. Every slip of the tongue. Oh, don't you hate it when that happens? It's like... (laughs) Try to shove it back in there. It's not going back in. It's out. But it's not out because it was just in your tongue. You weren't walking down the street and get hit with a profanity brick. If it came out of your mouth, it came from inside you, not from outside in. It came from inside out. And the problem is is that we have all these little reasons and we think, well, well, I got mad. I don't normally get mad. Yes, you do. It's in there. You may be really, really good at suppressing it. You may be really, really good at covering it up. But when you get squeezed, What's inside is coming out. And so the problem is, is if you notice that when somebody squeezes you, that yucky stuff comes out, it's because the yucky stuff is inside. And the only way to get it out is to allow the Holy Spirit to remove it. The only thing that can happen is not a matter of a change of our behavior. I mean, we've all talked about, we've all heard people about, you know, I was doing really good, and then I... I fell off the wagon. And it can be any wagon, all right? And they'll go to the lake. I fell off the wagon and up underneath the wheels, man. I'm just, I'm, I'm just like totally here by this thing. I, 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 I slipped, I tripped, I fell. Well, it isn't a matter of just slipping and tripping and falling. It's a matter of not yielding that part of your life to the Lord who says He wants to make all things new. He wants to make everything new. He wants to come in and He wants to take and clean out all that junk and replace it with that which is worthy and so if you find yourself in that place of every once in a while once in a while letting something fly man that's a good place to go lord i need you to work on that in my life lord i don't want that to be my first response to a negative situation i don't want that to be any response other than what you would have me to respond and here's the cool part if we ask him he'll do it If we ask Him, He'll do it. He'll come and allow us to start recognizing. But we have to be honest with Him. It's not about just going back and asking time and time and time and time again for forgiveness for exactly the same activity and behavior. (sighs) How many of you in here got kids? How many times can they tell you they're sorry for doing the exact same thing before you don't believe them anymore? You're really not sorry. You've just figured out this sorry pattern. You're still willfully doing that which I told you not to do. And then when you get caught, which tells me that you're doing it ten times more than what I'm detecting. And when I catch you, then you go, sorry. (laughs) No, you're not. If you were sorry, you would change your behavior. If you were sorry, you would allow the Spirit to minister within our hearts. Say, Lord, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to be that way anymore. I want you to change that within me. Lord, I want you to give me the strength. I want you to give me the power to be able to overcome these things in my life that I know don't glorify you, don't bring honor to you, and they cause me to be in a place where my words are not justified, but are condemning. Then some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Still standing firmly against the Lord, the Pharisees say, Prove it. Prove who you are. 
Prove to us that you are the Messiah. And even in the midst of the miracles, the Pharisees refused to believe who he is and who he said he was. One would think that healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, giving hearing to the deaf, raising the dead would have been enough proof. But their view was not based on a lack of proof, but on a lack of faith. These guys had already made up their mind about Jesus Christ. They took a position in saying that if you want us to believe in you, then you have to show us the you we want to see. Did you get that? If you want us to believe in you, then you need to reveal the you that we think you should be in our lives. You need to be the Jesus I design, the Messiah that I would prescribe, not the Messiah that you are, but the one that I want to see. So show us a sign in alignment with how we want you to be. In Hebrews 11, 1, it says, Now the faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I love that verse, you see, because everybody wants to say, Oh, well, you Christians. That's how they talk. You have blind faith. And I'm like, no, no, <laughs> wait a minute. I don't have blind faith. I have a substance of the things that I hope for. There's substance there. There's evidence of things that I can't see that happen through my God that I see every day in my life that I see His hand working and I see these evidences and I see these proofs and I see His Word come to life in my life and the Holy Spirit changing and directing me from the inside. You can't tell me there's no evidence that there's no proof. I can look at this room and see evidence and proof of faith. But there's times when we act just like the Pharisees. Okay, yeah, I know you died for my sins. Okay, Lord, I get that. Thank you for my salvation, but <laughs> what have you done for me lately? I mean, what are you going to do about this situation? How are you going to get me out of this mess? Have you ever noticed how we put faith in some of the weakest things, we will exercise the strongest amount of faith. I mean, can you imagine if every Sunday before I got up on this platform, I called three guys to come and test its sturdiness. I stood down here, and I made them get up there, and I had them jump up and down, and three of them jumping up and down, up and down, before I would climb up on the stage. Because I didn't have faith that the stage would hold me. I had to have it proved every time that I came into the place. You guys would be looking to replace me. I know, now some of you are thinking, well, yeah, but that's ridiculous. Because you can see it. You know what's underneath it. Once you see it, once you demonstrate it, well, now it's seen and it's solid underfoot. So that's not a good analogy. All right. I'll give you that. But we put faith in things that we hear, don't see. We'll put faith in a news report or in a rumor. I love rumors. I love rumors in the church. It's amazing to see how people respond to rumors. Somebody came to me the other day. Somebody doesn't even go to this church. I actually went to one of my kids, I think, and told them that I was leaving. <laughs> right away. Quickly. I was moving. They don't go to this church anymore, but they know. He's leaving. I went, where am I going? <laughs> what it seems like is that they must have gotten the confusion between my daughter's going to school at the end of the month, thinking that because my wife will probably follow him that I had to go. <laughs> but what was funny is somebody in the church got all upset. He's leaving. No, I'm not. If I ever get ready to leave, I'll let you know. I just want to know where I was going and who was paying for it. I could start a rumor that in order to come to this church, you have to wear yellow hats and red suspenders. And some of you being faithful would form a committee to try to determine what kind of red hats and yellow suspenders that you needed. 
Some of you would go out and invest in red hat and yellow suspender stock and start opening up Vindy, and then others would form a committee to see how quickly they could replace me as your pastor. <laughs> but there would be belief in something totally unseen. How about if your child came home from school and looked at you and said, Mom, I know you said that there would be dinner tonight, but I'm really worried that there won't be. Can you show me dinner? I mean, I know it's early in the afternoon, but I'd really like to see dinner because I don't really know if it's going to be there when dinner time comes. So would you show me it? Can I touch it? And then I'll have faith that there'll be dinner tonight. I know how you moms would look at that. You should get out of my kitchen. <laughs> or what if little Johnny came home and he went to dad and he said, Dad, I'm, I'm really worried. I don't have enough faith that the house is going to be here tomorrow. And if the house isn't here, I won't have a place to sleep. It won't be warm. It's cold outside. Can you show me? Can you prove to me that the house is going to be here? Well, at first, as parents, we might think, oh, they're going through a stage. They're learning something in school. This is just one of those kid stages. And so we would just, oh, it's okay, little Johnny. You'll be okay. The house will be here. But if they ask you that every single day for a week, you'd want to strangle the child. <laughs> what is wrong with you? Was the house here yesterday when you came home? Yes. Was it here the day before? Yes. Was it here the day before that? Yes. Do you think then it's not going to be there tomorrow? I don't know. <laughs> I don't have enough faith. And then they go on the whole dinner thing again. It's like, stop it. Now see, we think that's funny to you apply it to yourself and God. Has God ever let you down? Has He ever not provided what you need and then some and yet so many times we go we're afraid we're not going to eat when around here have we ever been afraid we're not going to eat <laughs> i'm not going to have a place to live oh lord don't you see I, and he just goes do you have any faith you see that's what was happening with the pharisees is that they didn't have any faith to go along with that which they wanted to see even if jesus would have shown it to them if they'd have given him a sign it wouldn't have mattered he answers them he says evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign i think it's interesting that he pulled and correlated adultery in the worship of idols in the same phrase. You see, looking for a sign is to idolize something, is to hold something up. He said, if I show you a sign, what's going to happen is you're not going to put faith in God, you're going to put faith in the sign. You're going to follow the sign. You're going to follow that which you can see, not which that you can't see. You're going to see what, follow what you see, but you're only going to follow it to a degree because we know that signs and wonders don't bring faith. They don't precede faith. Signs and wonders, listen, follow faith. They follow it. The Lord says, I want you to have faith. You say, well, Lord, then show me and I'll believe. He says, you believe and I'll show you. You believe and you won't need to go Looking for evidence. Evidence will be everywhere in your life in relationship to my provision for you, my protection for you, that which I provide, the blessings that I pour out upon you. And for those that are sitting here today, I hope that that's where you're living. I hope that your faith is producing the signs and wonders and the evidences and the proofs that you know that you need in order to establish your faith. See, the Israelites had all kinds of signs. Open it up in the Red Sea, go across on dry land. Get to the other side. The Lord puts the water back together and destroys Pharaoh's army. They get on the other side, and there's a pillar of fire by night that lights their way and clouds during the day, and a cloud in the desert's a good thing. It cools it down immensely. The cloud was over top of them, and then when they needed to move, the cloud would move over here, so they'd <laughs> get back under the cloud. When they were hungry, he fed them with bread from heaven. None of that stuck because they still out in the middle of the desert where we want to go back to Egypt. So signs don't bring faith. Faith brings signs. This is no sign will be given. Except the sign of the 
prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise in judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Sol Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus says you're only going to get one sign. The sign is going to be my death, burial, and resurrection. Jonah was a prophet. Went to the Gentile city of Nineveh. He didn't want to go. Matter of fact, he ran from God. He didn't want the Gentiles to be saved. And we know the rest of the account. We know that God got his attention by taking him on a little fishing excursion in a cruise. He just didn't realize initially that he was going to be the bait. <laughs> Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, gifted by God, given wisdom because that's what he asked for, and everything else came to him. And Jesus says, one that's better I'm better than Jonah, not because of what I bring in message, but because I do it without the hesitation. You see, I'm going to be faithful to the Father. I'm not going to run. I'm wiser than Solomon because I'm the one that gave Solomon his wisdom. And in the middle of this debate, Jesus takes time to share a parable. This is when an unclean spirit goes out of a man. He goes through dry places, seeking rest, and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and he takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter and they dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first state. So it shall also be with this wicked generation. There's been a lot of folks that struggle with this parable. A lot of folks don't understand. The parable is identifying something that is so easy if we just keep it in the context in which it's given. The parable identifies the danger of outside reformation without inside regeneration. In other words, changing or cleaning up the outside without changing and cleaning up the inside. In order to understand this, we need to keep it in total context of who and what Christ was speaking of at the time. You see, the Jews had made really great progress in cleaning up their house. The Jews coming back from captivity had purged themselves of idol worship. They had, had kind of purged the land. They got back into the temple. They had swept the house out. They had cleaned it all up. The problem was is that after they cleaned out their religious house, they left it empty. They didn't fill it with God. He was not dwelling within their worship. And because of that, because the house was empty, it created this incredible opportunity for other sins to come in. The Jews had a religion and they had an outward morality, but their hearts were empty and their religion was in vain. And because of this condition, Satan was able to re-enter the house and the latter condition of Israel was worse than when they started. The Old Testament Jews were steeped in idol worship. The New Testament Jews were seeking and plotting to kill their own Messiah. That's bad. The transition and where they had gone was becoming ever increasingly wicked and sinful. And while Christ was addressing the present generation. The same thing happens today. How easy it is to reform ourselves, put off old habits, start going to church and go to Sunday services, clean up our act, live a responsible life, go to a program that helps us to overcome some of the bad habits that we have. The problem is, is that if the change is not taking place in our hearts, it becomes a false righteousness, a false religion that will only last for a time. It says, and Satan will get a hold of that empty vessel and will wreak havoc with it. 
Religion means cleaning up the outside. Salvation means a new life of holiness from the inside. 2 Peter 2 and 20 says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. You see, we can put lipstick on a pig, and it's still going to be a pig. Have you ever wondered how it is that a dog... Oh, we're not going to go there. Just don't let the dog lick you in the face, okay? <sighs> come back. Everybody come back. The only hope for mankind is Jesus Christ. Not on the outside, not with religion, not with appearance, not by walking through the doors of this church and cleaning up your act long enough to put on an appearance for those that are here that we would look upon you and go, wow, wow, isn't, isn't she great? Isn't he wonderful? What a man of God. What a woman of God because of what we see here. Only knowing that in your heart that you've not translated that to a yielding of the Holy Spirit and allowing God to wash you from the inside out. And you know as you walk out of this place that which is still dwelling in you, you are so desirous of being free from, but yet you haven't asked. The Lord says, be careful. Because the end condition may be worse than how you started. I can't tell you how many people that I know that have come and seen what happens here within the fellowship of the church. And it's a drawing thing. When you come in and there's nice people, when you come in and there's servants and there's activities and there's things that are going on and people are, are genuinely joyful in the Lord and, and, and they come in and they, and they go, wow, I want a piece of this. I'm going to start hanging around here. I'm going to start being a part of it. This is wonderful. And yet they're looking at the outward appearance of what is happening on the inside without realizing that it has to take place on the inside first and they change their outward appearance and then they fall away and then we see them a month two three six months down the road hey brother what happened to you man i thought you were coming well you know i tried it it just didn't work for me that whole religious thing you know i mean i know you guys you know you guys got your thing in that but it just it doesn't work for me and their condition now is one of thinking that there's nothing that Jesus has for them because they never committed to Jesus Christ. They looked on the outside. They looked at the appearance. They looked at the clean house. They looked at the, the, the participants that looked good on the outside but never translated that in their own hearts and minds to understand that that has to happen on the inside. This is while he was still talking talking to the multitudes. Behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside seeking to speak to him. And one of them said, Look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. I like the picture that we have here. It doesn't say, While Jesus was preaching, while he was standing on his soapbox scolding the brood of vipers. No, it kind of gives the idea that he was just talking. And especially when we see this aspect of the parable, I believe that Jesus just loved to relate and to just talk to people and just share. He's talking to them. The mother and the brothers show up. Mark's gospel gives us a little bit different insight. Mark's gospel says they thought he'd gone nuts. He was going too far. He was, he was being politically incorrect. He was calling the Pharisees, a brood of vipers. He was, he was chastising them. He was claiming to be the Son of God. Now, his mother knew he was the Son of God. 
But she was afraid for him. In her mother's heart, she was afraid. He's saying stuff's going to get him in big trouble. He needs to stop. His brothers weren't on course yet. They didn't get it. They didn't realize who he was until after his resurrection. So they're thinking, man, we need to go bail out little Jesus, man. He's in big trouble. Our big brother, he's, he's saying things that he shouldn't ought to be saying. He's going to get He's going to get crucified. Hmm. Look at what he says. He answered them and said to the one who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hands towards his disciples and he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Don't share that verse with those of the Catholic persuasion. It's pretty disrespectful of Mary. Oh, I don't think that was his intention. But I think he was looking to set the record straight in relationship to how it is that we have relationship with God through Him because it's not based on who we are on this earth. It's based on who we are in heaven and who the Father sees us to be. And as we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, then we are a part of His family. But I also think that it's interesting where His family was. His family wasn't on the inside listening. They were on the outside Observing. Have you ever been on the inside of something that God is doing and other people that are on the outside are telling you that you're nuts? People from the outside observing what's going on on the inside rather than being on the inside. You see, where Mary and where Jesus' brothers should have been is not outside saying, bring him out to us. They should have said, let us come into him. Because, see, they were every bit as in need of salvation as the people that were listening to him. You see, they didn't get a ride. Mary didn't get a ride because she was used as an instrument of God to bring his son into the world. She had to receive her son as her own savior. So did his brother. So did anybody else that was related. But we need to be on the inside of what God is doing, not standing on the outside. I love that Jesus puts into practice here, and we'll close on this thought, what I like to refer to as the whosoever clause. I like this. The whosoever clause. For whoever does. You see, God sent His Son in the world that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. You see, we get to be those who choose, who become a whosoever. And when we become a whosoever, we're on the inside. Not on the outside looking in. We're on the inside. And what's even more amazing is that the inside is where Jesus wants to be. Where He wants His Spirit to dwell. Changing us into His image for His glory and His honor. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we thank You.